Hello. Okay. Everybody here? How would you know? Um, so my real name is Aaron Leverett. Uh, most people know me as Black Swan Burst or BSB. Um, I'm going to do a talk about industrial control system security. I don't expect many of you uh, work in this space. Um, if you do, then this will be very abstract. Um, and you can get more technical detail later. We can hang out after the talk if you would like. Uh, this is going to be a rambling, crazy talk because I'm a rambling, crazy person. Um, but the main thing is a good talk should be like a comet, right? It should be dazzling and brilliant and over in a flash. And I can't really manage the first two, so I'll aim for the latter. So it's going to move really quickly, OK? So before I begin, I'd like to have some idea of, of, of who uh, is in the audience. Um, who was here at EMF camp last time? All right, cool. Um, who's here at EMF camp this time? Good, just making sure you're awake. Uh, are there any other hackers in the audience in the security sense? Yes? Okay. Any white hats? Any black hats? Any intelligence agents? They never raise their hand. Oh, there's one. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, okay. We'll get on with industrial control system security. So I don't usually like to talk too much about myself, but since many of you don't know me, you probably want to have some idea of my credentials. Um, instead of giving you a giant CV of all the places I've worked and the hundreds of uh, engagements that I've done testing industrial systems, I'll just give you this picture to give you a sense. Um, I've been doing this for about two and a half years uh, as a, an industrial person, if you, if you like. What I mean by that is I've been a penetration tester and researcher for IO Active for the last two and a half years. Before that, I was doing my master's at Cambridge, where I rescued 10,000 industrial systems from the internet for a laugh. Um, and before that, I worked at GE Energy and Quality Assurance, uh, testing various uh, domain um, systems. So, you know, distribution management systems for the electric grid primarily, uh, but also other systems used in the electric sector. Um, before that, I was doing other stuff that's not terribly interesting. So, I think people should care more about infrastructure in general, particularly geeks, particularly EMF camp. I think infrastructure is really interesting. I think we all depend on it. Um, and I could make a big hand wavy argument about things blowing up and what would happen if we didn't have water or power. But I think that's all kind of a bit boring. Instead, what I'd rather do is encourage you to think about infrastructure, care about infrastructure, go and visit it, find out in your local neighborhood what's going on. And one of the things that's really exciting about EMF camp is you actually have that opportunity. My favorite talk at the last EMF camp was how we rolled out power, uh, sanitation, showers, to you guys for three days uh, along with internet and then tore it all down and drove it away. And so if you're interested in some of these things, go and find out how some of it works here. When I was about 14, uh, my mother, who is um, loosely analogous to Sarah Connor, made me build a water filter um, to teach me about water filtration. And as much as it was like a really irritating thing to have to do as a 14 year old, like, oh, mom, I don't want to build a water filter. Um, I did it, right? And at the end, I learned a lot about how to clear uh, sand out of the water filter and how to dry it out in the sun and make sure it didn't you know, get an algae infection or anything else. Um, and, and so I encourage you to do these same sort of things. Embrace some little project on infrastructure and find out more about it. And even if you're not um, a programmer or a hacker in the security sense, um, you know, just get interested in this stuff, right? So this is a brief tour of my kind of hell and why industrial system security is so difficult, um, but also where it can be really exciting and maybe some research opportunities for you. So everyone likes a good joke. An optimist would say the glass is you know, half full, pessimist, half empty, but the engineer believes it's over-provisioned for this particular task. And I use this to illustrate the kind of people that I work with, right? I do have a, a, a bachelor's of engineering, but I'm also a computer scientist now. I studied artificial intelligence, and I find myself lumped into the Komsky camp by all of the engineers. Um, and that's okay, but when we sit down and have conversations, they have a very different attitude, and, and I'm trying to use this to, to illustrate that. Part of what this talk is going to illustrate today is a, a false dichotomy that I see in the space between safety and security. So what do we mean by that, right? <clears throat> Everyone understands that safety in an industrial system is incredibly important, right? You're dealing with inert gases that might fill a confined space. 
you're dealing with flammable materials, right, if you're working in oil and gas. Um, with electricity, you know, there's a danger of being shocked or um, providing too much electricity or bad frequency of power to a device and burning it out in some way, right? Uh, with water, you're dealing with large pressures and you can have a burst because of that. So, but what do we mean by safety on, the, on a sort of computational level? And it means that we don't want, um, we don't want change on these devices without knowing about it. So you don't want a firmware upgrade in the middle of um, pumping water into a, a giant tank, right? Because that upgrade could, could leave uh, the messages that are, that are passing along that network in a state that it continues to pump and builds up too much pressure and either burns out the pump or, or blows the tank in some way. So we're focused on no change without permission, loosely speaking. Um, now that can be change of values, but it can also be change of firmware or change of devices. And there is some redundancy in these systems, but from a security perspective, redundancy doesn't do very much for us, right? Because if I can compromise one switch, I can compromise the other. Um, and since some of you don't work in this space, that, that is what I do. Lately, I've been focusing on compromising industrial Ethernet switches, changing their firmware, writing malicious firmwares, um, and abusing the, the firmwares to alter the traffic that's flowing across those networks. Okay. So, the important thing here is that safety people have an assumption, and the assumption is that the, the code or the firmware has not been changed without going through proper channels. Because they have these processes in place and they say, don't touch this device, don't change this device, um, and no one's come to them and said, okay, I changed that device, then they believe it's still in the same state it was when they started. Um, in a physical world, that's a relatively good assumption. You can keep your eyes on things. But in the digital world, that's not always true, right? In particular, I find that the hardware and the firmware don't support these features, right? So I can do, say, an MD5 or SHA-256 check on a firmware, um, but the device itself in an industrial system doesn't always do those checks on its own, right? Okay, so what about the, the security culture? We run around like our heads are on fire and we panic and we tell everybody to patch stuff because they're using Telnut. Um, and that's sometimes a little bit unfair, especially in a working operational environment. We make safety people crazy because we're asking them to change things that are already functionally safe. And, and the fact that they've had to go through months of um, proving to some auditor that this is functionally safe means that when they update it, they have to go through that whole process of six months of, of proving it again. And that can be deeply, deeply frustrating for them. So the assumption on the security person's part is that it has, it has been changed unless you prove it hasn't been changed, right? Someone has altered the firmware when you weren't looking or you weren't paying attention, and you need to consistently verify that the firmware of some device um, has not been changed. Now, you could also talk about this in terms of protocols. It doesn't have to be the firmware, right? The, the traffic on the wire can be altered as well, and you want some sort of cryptographic assurance that it hasn't been altered. Now. Um, because I've worn this preposterous mustache today, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this in the most ridiculous way I possibly could um, with, a, with a card trick. So, to prepare for this trick, um, we'll need to set you know, the deck in advance, get some people to inspect it, get some people to uh, help me out uh, in verifying the condition of, of this particular deck. Um, I know you guys, so I should... I should probably not start at this end because I know these guys, so I'm going to go over here. And, and at the end of the, end of the, the talk, I'm going to need 11 people to help me out for this. Um, so hopefully you're going to be willing to volunteer and come forward because if you all just stand back there, it's going to be very, very awkward. Um, so anyways, let's make sure this is a real deck of cards and it's shuffled and it's different.
All right, so we're going to use this as a demonstration of, you know, firmware um, being altered, which, I don't know. Like I say, at the bottom is a terribly shoehorned metaphor, but it gives me an excuse to be strange in the middle of my talk. So I'm going to set this aside right here on this top hat, and it's your job to watch this deck of cards and be sure that it doesn't change order somehow during the, during the rest of the talk. Can everyone see that? Okay, so this photograph I took while I was on holiday, and I think it demonstrates pretty much um, one of the conflicts between safety and security. Now, I realize that you probably can't see this very well, so I'll point out some of the details. <clears throat> but take a look carefully, right? This is, uh, this is a medical device for helping restart a heart, first aid, right? Safety first. But it does have an access code down the side. I don't know if you can see these buttons along the side here. And written on top of that device is the access code, 2888, I guess, uh, so that people can get hold of this device whenever something is happening. Now, this is by the side of a port up in Scotland. Um, so presumably, the access code is there to keep people from stealing it, right? But it's like the security people and the safety people haven't worked together. They haven't thought about this in advance, and so you just have to post up the access code on the top. And I find that really frustrating because safety people are intelligent, interesting people, right? Security people, intelligent, interesting people. But they're kind of at odds with each other all the time because of this culture clash. And I don't think the culture clash actually exists. It's just that the technologies that have been put in place have been put in place without communication between the two sides of the equation. And they've been encouraged to think about it this way because the features of these devices don't support safety the way it needs to be. So as, as a good example of this, do we need an access code on this at all? An access code is actually completely ridiculous. The whole point of this device is that it's available to you in an emergency. So the access code is getting in the way of being used quickly, right? So maybe what we should be focusing on in this particular case is logging, detection, incident response, and maybe even some sort of tracking device. So if someone does steal it, you can try and recover it, or even just CCTV, putting a CCTV camera over this, so if someone uses it for the wrong purposes, you can record the event and report it to the police or do something. Um, and this is my point, like this, this false dichotomy of safety versus security needs to stop, and we need to kind of collaborate in this sense. So one of my favorite concepts is passive safety. <clears throat> now I know everyone in here, has spent uh, hundreds of hours working with uh, liquid fluoride thorium reactors. Um, I myself have also logged zero hours on one of these reactors. But I was, I was given this as an example. Like, I was told to read up on these by a mentor of mine. Um, and he said to me that, you know, one of the interesting things uh, in these reactors is this sense of passive safety, right? So um, the reacting vessel and the salts that are reacting with each other decay naturally and stop reacting on their own, um, which is very useful because you have to maintain the reaction to, to keep things going. But the main thing is that it has a freeze plug in the bottom of this reactor. And you have to apply energy to this freeze plug. You have to continually cool this freeze plug. And if you don't, if you don't apply energy, then it sort of melts away and everything drains into a heat sink and a drainage tank underneath the reactor and the reaction sort of slows all on its own and everything decays to a safe state, right? And I find this really, really interesting, fascinating principle. If you apply energy or apply X continually to this thing, then when it does fail, it fails into a safe state. And, um, I'm kind of curious, would it be possible to use this passive safety concept in a security sense? Can we continually apply some cryptographic principle and when the system fails, it fails safely and it fails securely? I'm not sure, but that's why I'm talking to you people. You're filled with ideas and you're here for EMF camp for exactly that reason. So, kernel attestation, right? This is one of the things we could use in industrial systems where the kernel continually uh, attests to the fact that it hasn't been altered and that certain properties are maintained. One of the big problems with this in practice is the massive overhead of messages and the constant sending of messages back and forth across a network. Um, sometimes that would violate our real-time constraints, for example. Um, but it's still an interesting idea, and I feel it's just pushing onto the edge of that passive safety, passive security kind of um, concept. 
We have a big problem with patching because of the safety problems that we discussed earlier in the industrial systems world. Uh, I know for, for a fact, having studied a bunch of these systems and reading other people's white papers on the subject, that it can take 18 months before they even want to apply a security patch to some of these devices, including Windows NT and Windows XP machines. Right? Not only that, it's 18 months before they start the process, and then sometimes six months to get the paperwork in order to actually be able to apply the patches. Um, I've found a number of you know, zero-day vulnerabilities in industrial Ethernet devices, mainly switches. Like I say, that's my passion at the moment, mostly because PLCs and RTs and so on had already been done. But my point is, whenever I find those, I go through a coordinated disclosure process, which is very painful, I can assure you. And even once I've got the patch in place with the vendor, which you know takes three to six months, I can be pretty certain that when I go to do pen tests on these devices, I'll still be able to use the vulnerabilities that I found for another two years, right? Because it takes that long to roll the patches out. So I'd like to move towards a model of continual patching. You know, certainly with a Linux machine, on most occasions you can uh, up, update you know all of your sources, bring in uh, all the new code and the security updates and you don't have to reboot your machine every time you do it, right? So I find it a little bit ridiculous that if we can do that with a Linux machine, that the, you know, these other devices are using embedded Linux most of the time, and somehow they need to reboot every time you apply some patches. So maybe we could move past that, right? Firmware checking, cryptographic checking of firmwares, it's okay when you find it. I very rarely find it, but when you do find it, it's typically um, a cryptographic checksum, essentially, a hash, right? And so that hash is checked when the device boots up, uh, if you're lucky, or when the update is rolled out, but it's not necessarily checked the rest of the time. So all you have to do is play with the time of check, time of use, the talk to up there. So I make sure that when the firmware is, is booted up, it hashes correctly, and then afterwards I switch the firmware and it runs you know, whatever I want, right? Um, so we'd like to move away from that sort of model of, of firmware integrity. Um, Detection and response, I think, is more useful in some ways than focusing on the firmwares. And the idea of sensor fusion with trust levels, OK? Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. OK, so if any of you study in this field, uh, I advise you to take a picture of this now. These are the protocols you'll get to have a chance to look at. These are mostly unauthenticated protocols and mostly protocols without any integrity, um, which is really disturbing because this is controlling your industrial infrastructure. Go and look them up, find out for yourself. You don't need to be a hacker to check that all on your own. We have real time constraints in these systems. Um, what I mean by that is a message might need to get from one device to another in milliseconds or microseconds to guarantee some safety condition. This makes the cryptography in this environment very, very difficult because we have to do the cryptographic computations within that time scale. Um, and also, we usually have some you know, resource constraints, memory, processing, entropy, and random number generation, these kinds of problems. Um, key management is also a nightmare. Uh, the thing I find most often these days is hard-coded cryptographic credentials, whether they're used for SSH or SSL. Um, there's a big uh, movement to wrap TLS or SSL around every industrial system protocol. Uh, which means all of these different devices need to have different keys and we need to manage them. How do you do that in a real-time sense? It's quite a challenging problem. If you're interested in cryptography, you can go that direction and study some of that. Okay, I think threshold cryptography is far more interesting. Does anyone here know what a zero-knowledge proof is? Excellent. One. Okay. Two. Zero-knowledge proof? No? Three? Okay. So a zero-knowledge proof... Um, I think they're really interesting. The, the basic idea is, let's say I know something, and I want to prove to you that I know this thing, but I don't want to reveal to you the thing that I'm proving. This is the simplest example I could find. My favorite personal example involves uh, the graph three coloring problem and proving the isomorphism of the graph or the solution for the graph. But let's just stick to this simple one for the moment. Um, let's say Alice has two cups and wants to claim that they both contain the same amount of marbles. And then Bob wants to verify this. Um, then Alice can offer two buckets that also contain a number of marbles. And Bob can choose which cup gets poured into which bucket, right? And then Bob can count both buckets and make sure that they both match. And in the process of choosing which cup goes into which bucket, if we assume that they were different and not actually the same, that Alice is lying to us, then, and that 
Alice had sort of rigged the buckets down below so that they would match up, then there's a 50% chance of him having chosen the wrong buckets and that coming out all right. So I don't know if you can see this down here at the bottom of, of step three, but you can have a 50% confidence for the first game, 75% confidence for the second game, and 95% confidence after the fifth game that they do indeed contain the same marbles. So this is loosely speaking how interactive zero knowledge proof systems work. And my argument is that you can embed this into some of the industrial systems protocols because the first five messages that are exchanged in industrial system protocol are not usually that important. And some of the sessions are maintained for years at a time. So you would slowly be building confidence and you would only perform sensitive operations once you had built confidence to a level that you're comfortable with. So far, I haven't seen many people explore this idea, so I'm encouraging you to think about it. Um, in a presentation about six months ago, I asked the vendors of these systems if they would commit to a six-month average patch time. And I specify average because some bugs are really thorny and really difficult. And I asked them, if I come to you as an outsider and I produce you know, something I consider to be a failure in security terms or an exploit for one of your products, will you patch within six months? And this is the response I got. In fact, I didn't even make this picture. This is, this is a fan picture sent to me after that presentation. Um, if you want to see the video, there's a nice awkward two-minute silence after I ask that question to six or seven of the big companies uh, who build these systems. OK. So this is about what you can do. I'm going to speed very quickly through it because I'm running out of time. Um, what could you do on the host scale? You can do better firmware verification. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing here, you can focus on that. Non-disruptive patching technologies and, and techniques in memory patching, for example. Uh, safe and secure defaults. Um, I, in fact, I haven't put formal methods analysis in here, but one of the interesting things you can do with OCaml these days is draw the model from the implementation and then do formal methods verification of the code um, in a sort of backwards way to make sure that it's not going to violate your safety constraints, right? Um, build for internet security, even though theoretically these are always deployed on private networks. Um, I always find that a little bit funny because, like I said earlier, I rescued 10,000 from the internet as part of my master's thesis. Um, Focus on forensics and supporting uh, detection technologies, incident response and, and detection technologies. So on the network scale, there's a lot of protocol work that could be doing. We could be adding cryptography to these protocols, adding integrity to these protocols. Um, Non-replay is another important cryptographic property that we want in this place. Um, and also another thing that I think is very interesting is there's some people doing sanity checking of the process values to make sure they obey the physics. Um, you know. Uh, a vessel can't heat up faster the, than the convection rate of the material that it's made from. If it is, you've probably got a, you know, a sensor error. So you can do a lot of interesting work verifying the process data itself without doing any cryptography at all. At the system scale, um, I would say we could do with some experiments with engineers, understanding of trust. Remember earlier I was talking about threshold cryptography um, and fusion of sensor values and their trust relationship? What happens if you have some sensor values coming from this field over here that have no cryptographic integrity, and you have some other from over here that, that do? How do you display those on a screen to a user to let them make decisions and know these might be false, these are probably accurate? Um, I think there's some interesting psychological research that could be done there without even necessarily building an industrial system, right? Uh, use alarms and anomaly detection in concert with safety people. Develop real-time key management strategies. At the site scale, stop dividing safety and security people. Put them together in a room and let them actually get requirements from the vendor to build the system differently. So avoid this false dichotomy and really ask the people present, why not? You know, what are the safety properties you need to be sure uh, have not been altered? And what are the security properties that you need to be sure um, are in place? Build an incident response plan, test security during factory acceptance testing and site acceptance testing. Write security requirements for the vendors and get them to stick to them. Um, and then another thing I think that would be interesting for any of you, just as citizens of the world who depend on infrastructure, is to learn about five industrial system security incidents. I do another talk about 10 uh, industrial system incidents that occurred before Stuxnet. Everyone talks about Stuxnet, but no one talks about the really boring attacks that occurred before that. And there's over 200 of them in a database. So these things do happen, and we should prepare as a society for them. 
At the nation scale, examine showdown results for vulnerable critical national infrastructure. Like I said, that was my thesis. Very effective. People are continuing that work to this day, uh, which is great for me because I can go and do other things. Study the falling cost of finding these vulnerable systems and participate with some of these other uh, organizations such as ANISA. And here in the rest of the world, if you're kind of a post-nationalist like myself, um, you know, respond to the reports of other countries about attackers coming from your country. Run honeypots and catch badness and just generally do research and try and help us out. Um, it's your infrastructure, regardless of whether you're interested in cryptography or industrial systems or anything else. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Ask the boards what they're doing about security. Um, reduce your own infrastructure debt. Consider, you know, there's people talking about making uh, 300 watt wind generators, which isn't very much. It's like a couple laptops and your phone and some other stuff. But, you know, they're going to build them from 3D printers and you can fit them in your backpack. Why not experiment with some of these tools and, and reduce your own infrastructure debts? Um, the main thing here at EMF, invent some decentralized uh, microgrid, micro-infrastructure tools and disruptive technologies. And I guess it's about time we get back to this. So I'm going to need 11 people. Could I have 11 volunteers? Come on up. Come on up. Okay, I'm gonna need one of you to, to help me out. Do you mind just, um, just saying stop? Stop. Okay, now it's important that you remember your card okay. when we do this trick, because if you don't remember your card, in fact, I have an easy way of doing this. Have we got 11? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One more? All right. Now, was this deck of cards altered during the talk? Did anyone walk up and change the deck of cards? It might have been. <laughs> Which is my proof entirely, right? Let's see if I can actually do this. Um, everyone, hold your cards to your chest. Think about your card. Let me see if I can get all of these and then go have a beer. Um, I have to admit, at this point in the performance, I sometimes wonder what would happen if I didn't get these. But just a thought. Um, if I name your card, please set the card back on the deck and walk back uh, into the audience. Let's see here. The Ten of Clubs. The, um, oh, this is interesting. We've got some Sevens. Um, we've got the Seven of Hearts, Seven of Spades, Seven of Diamonds, Two of Clubs, Ace of Hearts, um, Let's see, the five of spades, uh, the three of diamonds, the six of clubs, um, three of hearts, and the eight of spades. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this talk. I know it was a little bit random. If you're interested in these subjects and you want to get down into the deep technical details, I have some firmware files. I have some PCAPs. Come find me and some of the other hackers, and we can talk about industrial control system security. And um, I hope you enjoyed the mustache. I certainly do.